is lost ever be found could a garden come up from this ground at all you It's a good reminder, amen? amen. You know, the question is, how does you know how does God see each one of us? I, I don't know about you guys. I I know that God is real, and I, and I know that He's working every day in my life. Do you believe that He's working in your life? I, I really believe that. And as a Christ follower, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God connecting the dots in each one of our lives, um, and and I also know that we, according to Scripture and biblical truth, we have an adversary. We have an enemy of our soul, Satan, um, and a large part of what Jesus did while he was on earth was destroying the works of the evil one. In fact, Jesus said that. Um, and so we have two opposing pictures of each one of us. Um, on one hand, you've got the picture that God, through his word, gives you about your identity, that you are highly valued and that you are loved and that God's love is unfailing in your life. And that it's through the lens of God's love that we see our lives being transformed every day into new and beautiful things. Amen? Amen. On the other hand, we have Satan who wants to remind you of your life B.C., before Christ, and you got that other picture of your sins and your darkness that is being eclipsed daily by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. So the question, once again, my original question is, how do you see your life? That's a choice that you have there between those two opposing 
uh, optics. And in the middle is this fulcrum called faith. Y'all know the fulcrum, the seesaw? Remember in geometry class or whatever? And, and, and that's what we're talking about today is that amazing fulcrum of faith, the power and the gift of God that he's given you called faith that opens up God's promises, that opens up the life of God on your radar in your everyday life more and more. So um, you're probably aware and you've probably noticed that in the last several weeks since we started our latest sermon series, Unsheathing Faith. May I have the sword, please, buddy? Um, thank you, buddy. Um, that, that I've been using some pretty unorthodox um, sermon illustrations and sermon cues and word pictures, such as a sword. So last week I used a sledgehammer and a reflexive hammer. It was so funny. I was The other day before church, um, I was walking down the children's wing with this sword. And I thought, what is wrong with this picture, right? I can just see some new family coming into our church and they're like, I think I just saw the, the pastor. I think he's lost it. And he's got a sword, huge. Is he going to paint himself blue like William Wallace next week? I don't know. But what was funnier was I couldn't carry all my stuff and the sledgehammer. And so I had some precious old ladies in the church carrying my sword and my sledgehammer next to me. So we look like we're this dynamic trio going to take over the world, you know, one nursery at a time, you know, or whatever. It was really funny. Really funny. Um, but the, the reason why I've been going to unorthodox lengths to uh, share this message with, with you uh, is because Jesus did. Jesus used sermon illustrations, visual aids, if you will, to get the point across as he built a bridge from God's heart, God's truth, to your heart through the filter of your medulla oblongata. But, but there's a bridge there that God wants to establish of his truth that transforms our reality. Um, scripture talks about taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And, and that's part of this process is changing the thoughts and the patterns of the world that are not godly, the stinking thinking that I've referred to in the past, to things that are godly, that are biblically based, that Scripture calls us to think on things that are pure and true and lovely as God challenges and transforms our thinking. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, and, and we see this in Scripture. You know, in fact, other prophets of old and, and folks in Scripture use radical methods and means to get God's message across. Um, in Ezekiel, if you've ever read much of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, he was a master storyteller using the arts, using drama to portray God's heart. And God sent him to the people of Israel um, so that he could tell the message in a new way that could really get them thinking and scratching their head. In fact, one of the times in Scripture, I think it's Ezekiel 5, God told Ezekiel to shave his hair and to shave his beard and to weigh it out and to do certain things with it to get people's attention. That, and God was using that, and he, he prophetically told what was going to be happening in Israel to Israel because they had abandoned God's laws. And there's other things, some things socially inappropriate. You may want to read Ezekiel um, for some good reading there because there was some stuff that God told him to do that, were, that was quite radical in getting the message across. Why? Why, why, why? Why does God want us to go to such great lengths about his message? Because this message is great. The message of God's love, there is, it's unparalleled. The one who knows you the best loves you the most. And God wants you and I to understand this incredible message of grace. You know, it kind of, it begs the question for me, how far will you go to get a message to someone else, a message of life and death? Have you ever had to scream? Have you ever had to do something very unorthodox to get the message across to someone? Their life was in danger. You know, I remember years ago, I, I think I've shared this. I was on my way to church one early Sunday morning. It was cold outside. And I turned the corner, and my neighbor's house was on fire. And they were still asleep. And, and I was like, oh, my gosh, am I really seeing this? So I pulled up to their driveway. I ran in there, started banging on the door, you know, waking up the neighborhood because I was yelling. They weren't coming to the door. You know, I was dialing 911 and getting the fire trucks involved and everything. And what had happened was they had, that night they went to bed, and they were smoking in bed, and they, they had fallen asleep or passed out. I don't know which one. And they're... Their cigarette lit the mattress on fire and started a fire. And so they got up in the middle of the night. They realized what was going on. So they, they got the mattress and leaned it up against the house and went back to bed. And true story. And so a few hours later, I come around the block and their house is on fire because the mattress 
reignited. And, and I'm, I was grateful for the opportunity that, that I could, hey, hey guys, you need to get out of the house. There needs to, we need to do something about this. And that's just one example, but there's a spiritual lesson there. That if we truly believe scripture, then we believe that people's spiritual well-being is on the line. And, and, and it's not something to play around with. Like you don't play with matches. You don't play with people's lives. And so God has inserted you and I strategically by the power of the Holy Spirit, where you work, where you play, and everywhere in between, to be what Jesus calls the light of the world. But he gives you a choice because he said, don't hide it under a bucket or a bushel, but let your light be seen. And that's really a lot of what we're talking about here today. So today, um, I may use some visual aids, but, but actually, I'm going to let you use the visual aids today. Um, and I want to I wanna get you involved so that we can really get into this message. And, and, and I'm going to ask, we're going to play a game. Do you all like games? All right, so once again, this side likes games. Do y'all like games? Yes. All right, great. We're going to do this. Okay, scavenger hunt, okay? And so what we're going to do, and, and once again, these lights are burning my retinas, and I, I, I really wish I could see people better. Um, so I need some help. I need some help identifying who stands up, because I'm going to ask for some items, and um, somebody that knows the congregation better than me. I've st- been here a year, still trying to learn names. Is there somebody that's pretty decent with names, like knows people pretty good? Okay, Michael Lambert, are you here? Okay, I, I saw you raise that hand. No, I didn't. Come up here, Michael, with me, if you don't mind. Or actually stand right here, buddy, or somewhere. Let's give Michael a hand, you guys. All right. All right. So thank you. Wow, the lights just came on. Okay, great. All right. So what we're going to do is, and Jude, you can help me out with this too. Come over here, Jude the dude. Let's give Jude a hand. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some, you guys are going to get some real presents in my pockets, buddy. There's some chocolate. Can you? Who likes chocolate? Y'all like chocolate? All right. Go ahead and get those out. All right. So what what we're going to do is I'm going to ask for an object. Get your purses ready and your pockets ready because I'm going to ask for some objects that are on your person, okay? And so when you get it, I want you to stand up and Michael is going to help me identify who the first person to stand up was. That's all your job is. You got one job. Okay, buddy? And and if you know their name, great, or or whatever. If you don't, then we'll make up a name. Okay. So um, the first item that I need from you guys... I was like, dude, that's heavy. Something just clunked over there. What else do I have in my... I don't know. All right. Um, the first item that I need... You all ready? Car keys. Who has car keys? Oh, wow. That was quick. All right. Cherie got it. I'm, all right. Wow. You, get a, you have a baby and you stood up. You get like a bonus. All right. Cherie, come over here, hon. You're going to get something. You, go over, you get some chocolate from Jude, and I want you to stand right here in the front. Okay? All right. Michael, you help me out. I, I did that one because she was right there in front. The second one, Glasses. Who's got a pair of glasses? All right, good deal. Come on up, honey. Jude's got to just get you some chocolate here. All right, you can stand next to Miss Cherie. All right, next thing. This is a little, un, a little unusual, but who's got a flashlight, even on their keychain or your iPhone? All right, so, okay. Come on up, hon. Stand, you get chocolate. All right, what about antibacterial gel? All right, this, all right, great. Come on down, you get chocolate. All right, I'm seeing a trend here. And so we need some guys to step up. Okay, all right. Um, the last thing, yeah, you, yeah, I know, you had a baby. I'm, you, you, that's good. All right, all right, so the last thing, this is, this is kind of interesting. I don't know if everybody has this, but it's the Ring doorbell app on your phone. Who's got that? Y'all know what the doorbell app is, Ring? Okay. Well, you can only get one piece of chocolate. Sorry, hon. She's like, I really like chocolate. Give me more. Who is it? All right, Roger, come on up, buddy. Come on up. All right, now let's give all these folks a hand. Jude, you hook them up with the chocolate. Stay up here. Stay up here. Okay, now, now while y'all are standing up front, show the, the object, show the item, if you don't mind, if you have car keys, glasses, antibacterial gel, the ring app, or whatever, just, just hold it up there. Okay, let me ask the congregation something. What do these items have in common, you guys? Think about it. Each one of these. What do they have in common? Who wants to gander a guess and help me out with this? Say what now? A little louder. You carry them in your purse. purse. Yeah, you can. Safety. Safety. You're getting warmer. Huh? Okay. All right. So 
typically in church, the right answer is always Jesus, okay? But, but if you don't know, then maybe you can look on the screen because I bet these items have something to do with the sermon. Starts with an A, ends with an S. Access. Each, y'all are good. Wow, y'all are amazing. <laughs> Einsteins. All right, each of these items give you access to something greater that is essential. Does that make sense? Okay, and I'm going to explain each one of these. Y'all can be seated. Great job, you guys. Give them a hand. All right. So each one of these items, these visual aids, thank you, Jude, and you will get the rest of the M&Ms, buddy. All right. Um, and Michael Lambert, you too. My, love to my brother. Thank you for helping. So car keys are something relatively small, fit in your pocket, you know, or whatever. And car keys give you access to something greater called a vehicle. Isn't that correct? Yeah. And without the car keys, you do not have access to the amazing power of an actual controlled explosion of an engine of gas that's mixed with the right moist, uh, mixture of oxygen and the pistons and everything and the way it fires. But your truck or your car can, as y'all know, it gets you places. I mean, can you imagine going, walking from here to Bucky's in this heat? 8.1 miles, that would be crazy, right? Instead, we just get in our car and turn on the AC and we don't even think about it and we're, we're teleported, you know, through the miles and the asphalt and the unleaded gasoline to your destination. But it all takes place because of the keys that give you access. The second object, your glasses. Is, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm realizing more and more I cannot operate with my, without my glasses. I, I told the story, I, I have an orchard, 10-acre orchard down in uh, Tuscaloosa and a couple of years ago, I went to my orchard, I forgot my glasses, and I got there, and I could not see the combination lock. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm really limited, I need my glasses. So once again, glasses help open up a world uh, optically so that you can see what you need to see, sometimes even saving your life, perhaps. The next one, let me put my glasses on, is flashlight. You know, a flashlight, duh, helps you see things that are in the dark, and, and you got to see that stuff, so it's very important. Antibacterial gel, it kills cooties, right? We don't want cooties. We don't want viruses or whatever, and it helps. Also, the Ring Doorbell app helps you literally to see through a door. It's amazing. You know, you can even be outside somewhere else, not even at your house. Someone comes to your door, you can talk to them using that app. It's pretty neat, and no, I'm not getting any kickbacks from the Ring app company. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. So each one of these, uh, these objects today all give you access to something greater. In reality, they are small things that give you access to something much bigger. And, and that has a lot to do with our sermon today and the biblical truth that I believe that God wants us to unpack from his heart. It's found in the book of Romans, the New Testament book, that I would like to invite you to stand with me out of reverence for the reading of God's word as we go deeper into God's heart today through scripture. This is from Romans chapter five, verses one through three, the inspired word of God through the apostle Paul. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen for that? We have, you guys listen, you have peace with God. No matter what you've done, I'm not going to ask for your list of sins, for your list of, of things that you've done in your past. But the good news is that doesn't matter because through what Jesus Christ did on the cross, his blood signed your adoption papers and you have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. He made atonement so that now the best news of your day is not where you're going for lunch. Amen. The best news of your day is that you have peace with God. The rest is just sprinkles. The rest is just sprinkles on the cake. You've got the main thing. You have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through whom we have gained access, everybody say access, by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. This is the word of God. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let me get some water here. So the word of God that I just read is extremely valuable. In fact, it's the most valuable thing you own. More valuable than your house or your mortgage, depending on which one you have. Uh, more valuable than your jewelry, your vehicles. The word of God that sits on your shelf is more valuable than all of that. 
because God has entrusted that to us to love us, to show us his love. It's the longest love letter ever written. It also gives us insight into how we should live um, and, and gives us structure and understanding. I mean, the, the list goes on. And Paul, <clears throat> in this scripture today, as you, maybe you don't know, but Paul was like a terrorist in his former life, B.C. Um, he went by the name Saul. And as I've shared before, he went, simply put, he went from being a church burner to a church builder after God put the smack down on him, quite literally, on the way to Damascus as he was going to stamp out this new sect called Christianity in the early church. And Jesus said, knocked him down. I mean, like, boom, and, and said, why are you persecuting me? He's like, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. And it began this amazing testimony of, of God being transforming uh, power in this man's life. And so then he, he started churches all along the Mediterranean seaboard. Uh, it was amazing. I don't have time to go into his story. It's amazing. But part of Paul's passion is to grow these churches because Jesus Christ changed his life and he wanted everyone to know about it, as you and I should. And so Paul in the scripture is spoon feeding the basics of Christianity to this early church. Um, to the believers in, in Rome and, and, and spread throughout the, the Middle East. Now, how many of you guys have, have babies or you at one time had babies? Raise your hand high. Don't be ashamed. Some of you are like, yeah. <laughs> yes, I've had babies. We've got babies. They're a gift from God. Do you remember <clears throat> the, the complexity of, of teaching them to eat solid food and how fun that was wearing that food? Anybody else who used to wear that food? Yes, the bananas... You would say, okay, let's, there's a choo-choo, da 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 you know, and they're like, oh, bananas, bleh, you know, all over you and stuff like that. And not my kids, I, you know, but maybe yours did that. Um, but, but I remember the ordeal of, of let's eat together, buddy, and mmm, yum, yum. Well, in a spiritual sense, Paul is really trying to do this. He's trying to explain to these folks that were clueless about God and about grace, how this stuff works, that you've actually, you've got, you've got freedom now from your sins. You're made right with God, and, and it's an incredible thing. And so what, I want to read this again and kind of break down some of this Christianese that's used so we can really understand it and process it and digest what Paul's saying. So I'm going to read this again, this portion of Scripture. Therefore, since we have been justified, what does that mean? That's a big term. That means made right. Okay, therefore, since we have been made right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we have peace with God because of the degrees we have in college? Do we have peace with God because of the amount of money or the lack thereof in your checking account? Do we have peace with God because of what we look like? Do we have peace with God because of our ethnicity? No. We have peace with God because of one thing. The life and the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just kidding. I don't know what happened to the lights. I was just rolling with it. <clears throat> we did pay our power bill, didn't we? And by the way, y'all, <laughs> I say that joking, but lightning struck our church during the storms the other day, so it fried some computers and our lights in the traditional service. So it's kind of like in the, in the contemporary, we don't have air conditioning the way we want. In the traditional, we don't have light the way we want. So pray for us. <laughs> God's good, amen? amen? Jesus didn't need that stuff. Neither do I. I'm sweating like a stuck pig. Okay, all right, so where was I at? Um, what was the last thing I said? Anybody remember was paying attention? Man, that hurts. That just hurts. <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> okay, we're just going to jump right in. Um, say what? Okay, all right. I can't hear you over the fans. I love you, bro. But anyway, all right, so we're going to dive in here. All right, so we have this amazing... Oh, it's not through the check-in account. It's not through what you look like. It's not through these things that we offer. It's through what God did for you. When God put on skin, Jesus Christ... And he walked a mile in our sandals 2,000 years ago, and he gave his life for you and I. And so it's through that gift of Jesus Christ that we have reconciliation. And it's through whom, verse 2, through whom, through Jesus, we have gained access or we have received admittance, entry, or entrance, or an open door into God's grace that he has for us. And grace is all of God's favor and power and love that we will ever need in our life. So Jesus is the door that opens all of God in your life. 
And when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are opening a whole new way of living, a whole new way to be human that God intended for you to experience in his love. And it's because of that that we now stand by faith into God's grace. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For it is by grace through faith that you've been saved. This is not of yourself. It's not by your works, but it is a gift of God. And I, I share that with you because you cannot earn this. You cannot earn this. You can just receive it like a gift, a Christmas gift. You can choose to receive it or not. But this is what God has for you and I. We have to understand what God is offering to us. Because I think one of the biggest travesties in the church today is when good Christian folks don't embrace the gift that God's given them. In essence, they don't unsheath through faith what God has given them. Just like a sword on the battlefield, it does you no good. A sword does you no good if it remains sheathed. But therefore, God wants us to unsheath our faith and receive his promises and not just receive his promises, but let them become a part of who we are so that God through the Holy Spirit starts to change who we are so that I'm no longer Mr. Potty Mouth. Can I get an amen? So therefore, I'm no longer Miss Gossip. Can I get an amen? Whatever it is that God wants you to let go of, he doesn't just say, well, good luck with that. But he gives you his very Holy Spirit that, that does things, that dissolves the power of sin, that, that makes shame and guilt evaporate. It's supernatural. It's not a, something that you make happen. You do partner with God. You say, yes, Lord, to your power. But it's God's power working even in our weakness that makes the glory of God revealed in each one of us. That's why Paul said we have these treasures in jars of clay. In other words, it's like on the outside, man, I'm, I'm brittle but I've got the power of God inside of me and I want God out in my community to shine through me. Does that make sense? Makes sense to one, all right. So recently, I wanna brag. I, I know I'm not supposed to brag, but I, I feel the need to brag. Is that okay with y'all? All right, so recently, my, my wife gave, bestowed on me a great honor. <clears throat> Husband of the Year Award right here. I got it. I know you guys all wanted that, all you men, but I got it. At least I got it from my wife under my roof, so I feel good about that. And, and what I did was I did something that she's only asked me to do about 117 times. Isn't that great? I mean, y'all know, guys, how this is. Your wife reminds you, reminds you you don't have time, and then finally you make time. But anyway, I think I actually did this without her asking. But what it was was <clears throat> I put up these amazing lights, like uh, teardrop lights on our back patio, and it really changed the whole look. Like, it looks amazing. I mean, it's like the talk of the neighborhood. It looks so good. And, and, and I feel so good. And my daughter even said they look bougie, okay? Now, that's cool. That means cool. For all your dads out there that want to be cool and sound cool, just throw that around in the conversation. Yeah, those are some pretty bougie golf shoes there, Ted. You know, you can throw that out there. And don't say boogie because you totally ruin the effect. It's bougie, okay? So there you go. Um, but anyway, that's another story. But so when I was looking at these lights, when I was like embedded in these lights, putting them up there and everything, um, it dawned on me the whole power of this light bulb that changed the environment of my backyard and my back patio. It, all of this light derived from a single little source that was no, no much, no, not much um, larger than the, a human hair. If you've ever looked at a light bulb, and I encourage you to do that when the light is not on because it will burn your retina, but if you've ever looked at a light bulb, the whole glory, the whole power of this light bulb is from the filament. It is the thing in the light bulb that, that really is challenged and changed by the electricity. And it is as fine as a human hair. In fact, you can barely see it when you're looking for it. It's really amazing. And I started thinking about that. I started thinking... Wow, that, that really reminds me a lot about our life. Each one of us, we are, we are frail. We make mistakes. I screw up every day. I, I feel like I, I stumble all the time. But the amazing thing is, just like that light bulb, it takes something very small to make a huge impact. Just like access faith. Access faith is that thing in your life that opens up the door of what God wants to do and can do in your life. And Jesus said it's very small, this faith, like the size of just a couple of millimeters, the size of a, a mustard seed is what Scripture says. In Matthew 17, when Jesus is talking about your faith, he said something that small can move mountains. 
in your life. And the reason for that is, is because it's not the faith that does the work. It's God's power. Amen? So God just needs the little of you saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, in my marriage. Yes, Lord, in my job. Yes, Lord, in my child's life. Yes, Lord. Even if you don't see it, even if your, your rationale and your logic says this cannot be done, you say, yes, Lord. Can you say, yes, Lord? God calls you and I to say, yes, Lord. Like Peter in the, in the storm was raging and he said, Lord, if it's you, just tell me to come out and, and I'll come on out there. And Jesus said, come. He said, yes, sir. He took a step and that liquid became a solid under his feet. That is what access faith does for you and I. When the world says it can't be done, when the world says there's no way, you unsheath your access faith and you say, Lord, yes. Lord, yes. I will be obedient. And just like that little filament in that light bulb, God will use that little bit of obedience, that little bit of faith, to light up someone's world and change their environment forever. But it all hinges on choice. Will you utilize your faith? Will you get in the game? God has given his life so that you will be a changed life for you to be active in what God has called you to. Because the flip side of this sermon today is that when you choose to lose your keys that ignite your faith, when you choose to lose your access faith, you stall the work of God on your street. Do you honestly think God has given you that house or that job just for you? You are a missionary, brothers and sisters. God can provide money that you need through any means possible. He showed Peter this in Scripture when Peter needed some money he said, go catch a fish for your taxes. Pull out the two drachma coin. You've got what you need. God was showing him, I can provide for you any way I want. But he's inserted you, as I said a moment ago, strategically on your street. He has strategically inserted you at your job. Not for a paycheck, but to be the light of the world. The filament that God wants to use to ignite his chain reaction of the Holy Spirit on your street, in the boardroom on the baseball diamond, wherever you find yourself. Will you be the change agent that God's called you to be? And the reason why this is so important is in closing because of Matthew 13, 58. The scripture says, and he, Jesus, and Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Jesus went into a village he had God-sized plans, but he did not do many miracles in their neighborhood. Why? Because of their lack of faith. And because of their lack of faith, they were not willing to, and God evidently was limited in the fact that he did not do many miracles because faith is that catalyst God can snap his fingers and make all the bad go away, but he chooses, as you've heard me say, to use your hands, your hands of faith to say, yes, Lord, I will do it, whatever you want to do. But those people in that village, they weren't having it. And right there, the scripture says, and he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. I do not want to be that church. I'd rather swing for the fence and say, Lord, have your way in me. Have your way in my marriage. I pray that my marriage will be a gospel testimony to people that don't know Christ. I pray that my words, my actions, even though I fall so short, that, that my life will give the world a double take. That they will see something extraordinary, something supernatural in my natural me that points to my creator. That's the whole point. God's love in action through your hands, through your words, through your life. But for that to happen, there has to be that access faith. And for me personally, I've realized I can't live without faith anymore. It's my oxygen now. And I guess my question is, can you live without it? 
Because if you can live without your faith, you may not have any. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you're doing in our life. And I thank you, Lord, that you've got this incredible plan of transformation of each one in this room living in exchange life. Not in our own strength, Lord, just like that little filament, Lord, it can't do anything in and of itself. But when it's connected to its source, when that extension cord gets plugged into the power, things change. Lord, I pray that we can be that little that affects much. I pray, Lord God, that we can be like that beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You are the bread of life, Jesus Christ. You said it yourself. Help us, Lord God, to live in such a way to give the world a double take. In the name of Jesus, we all pray and God's people say, amen. So let's close uh, by standing with me um, in our closing song. And this is a time where we respond. And I want to give you the opportunity to come to the altar. I'd love to pray with you. If you would like prayer, if you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ, please put your hands out. That signifies for me that you would like prayer. If not, if you just want to come and do business with God, then bless you. I, I, I hope you come and you do that. But, but remain focused. Remember what we talked about a minute ago, tuning into the Holy Spirit as God leads you. God bless you.